committee, Minister Dilil, Deputy Minister Kivit, um, the chairperson of IDT, and, and the acting CEO, the CEO or the director of Infrastructure South Africa, um, the team from the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure, our support team from Parliament, greetings to you all. Um, Minister, this is the third meeting that we are having this week as the Portfolio Committee of Public Goods and Infrastructure having started on Tuesday uh, in playing our oversight role as uh, written down in the parliamentary uh, handbook and to the regulations, uh, rules and regulations of the members of the parliament. We have to receive a report from you as we all know that we have a new directorate in the department, which is Infrastructure South Africa. So we're expecting a briefing from them today. And also we will be expecting again another briefing from IGT. Um, with those words, uh, honorable members, I welcome you all in this meeting. Uh, I have um, one apology. Uh, of the minister saying that uh, if the meeting um, uh, exceeds beyond uh, three, she will have to leave the meeting because she is catching a flight. Uh, that is the only apology. Oh, another apology is that of Honorable Jobo, who is currently on the flight to Deben. She will join the meeting uh, later on today around half past one. She will be landing in Deben in half past one. She has been in Cape Town all these other days, but she will be landing in Deben in half past one. So she will join the meeting a little bit later. Um, I don't have any other apology. Are there any apologies that were forwarded to you, Ms. Mendy? Good afternoon, Chair. Um, none was forwarded to, to us. Okay, thank you. Um, we will then uh, hand over, as you can see, our agenda has been flighted on our screens. Uh, we will get a briefing uh, by ISA on the newly de designed the refurbishment operate and transfer program to be rolled out in a public-private partnership arrangement to deal with the backlogs due to government property and infrastructure not being properly maintained. And then we'll deal with IGT after uh, ISA. Over to you, Minister, to introduce your team. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chairperson, and good morning also to all the Honorable Members, um, Deputy Minister, and um, the other officials. Um, uh, Jefferson, uh, we brought the whole team for you today. Um, the ISA team will be led by Professor Jose Enzo uh, Ramahopa, and then also Ms. Mametsi Masamula. She is the Infrastructure Investment Planning and Oversight. Um, then Mr. Alvino Volska Prince, who is the Program Manager for infrastructure pipeline development and management. And then also from uh, public works and infrastructure, we have got Mr. Adam Tombeni, that's the acting director general for intergovernmental relations. Uh, Mr. Mpo Mashaba, director intergovernmental relations. And also uh, the deputy director general for construction and project management. Uh, sorry, he made an apology, Chair. He's not able to join us. And then we joined by Mr. Christopher Lombard, who is the DDG for facility management. So that is my team. I will go give straight over to you, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
proceed. So, Minister, who's going to be presenting? Oh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry. Um, I, I, I can't see that the Professor Amakopa is online yet. So I will ask Elvino Volska, Prince, uh, to lead us. Elvino, are you online already? No, he's also not there. Okay, can I ask Mametsi Masamula? Uh, Mametsi, can you take over for us and lead the presentation? Uh, I'm sure the other colleagues will join us later. Mametsi? And um, Ms. Medi, please give the hosting rights to the person who will be presenting. We'll do it. Oh, thank are. you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, Honorable Chair, uh, Honorable Members, uh, Minister uh, DM, and um, my colleagues from uh, DPWI. Uh, Minister, we have prepared a presentation um, uh, regarding the uh, ROTP. Ex uh, excuse the me, program. excuse me. Can we get the, the name of the person presenting? Because on our screen, we are just told VS01, whatever. So we don't oh. know and we can't even yeah. see the face. So that's, that's Sorry, a my, serious uh, issue. My apology, Chair, um, uh, Honorable Chair, is Mametsu Masamola. I'm on the call using my laptop and my mobile device. On the call, on the laptop, you can see Ms. Masamola, uh, Infrastructure South Africa. However, I'm struggling with audio uh, using my laptop. Uh, that's why I quickly had to switch to mobile so that I can just speak and then hand over to Mr. Tabang Kladi, who's going to take us through the presentation, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, my apology, I'll exit from my mobile and also uh, use my, my laptop. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Taban. Uh, thank you. Thank you, DDG. And uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair and the members of the committee, Minister and Deputy Minister, and my other colleagues from uh, Public Works and Infrastructure and IDT. So I'll request Chair if I could be given the rights to share the presentation if it's okay with you. And I will just switch off my camera because you've seen me so that I can save on the bandwidth while we do the presentation, if that's okay with you. Um, uh, just just before you switch off, Tabang, um, I've been made aware by Ms. Mendy that we are not yet correcting as the members of this portfolio committee. We are one member short. So I, I would like to check uh, from the committee itself whether should we continue or wait for this one member? Otherwise, right now, uh, uh, according to, okay, Honorable Crown Mare. Um, Chairperson, we're not taking any decisions at this point. We're just receiving a presentation. So my feeling would be that um, the, the lack of qu uh, quorum is not um, material at this point. Okay, okay, okay. So are we all agreeing, uh, honorable members, with what honorable Graham Murray is saying that uh, let's continue with the briefing, uh, but uh, hoping that uh, the briefing will end, uh, at least by that time, we'll be correcting. Honorable members, are we agreeing on it? Nele, do I agree, Chair? Yes. Honorable Hicklin, honorable Franz Calvey. I agree, Chair. Honorable Franz, thank you, Honorable Hickman. Honorable Franz Calvick. Thank you, Chairperson. I also will agree. Okay, thank you, Honorable Members. Uh, you may continue, Tabang. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members, for that opportunity. So, as I said, I will switch off my camera now, but hopefully I'm loud and clear and you can see the presentations on your screen. If you can just confirm that. Yes, we can see you, Tabang. We can see the presentation. Perfect. No, thank you very much, Honorable Chair. So uh, to the members of the Portfolio Committee, so the briefing today has already been introduced, is on the refurbish, operate, and transfer program to be rolled out in a public-private partnership arrangement uh, to address really backlogs due to the lack of uh, property and infrastructure and not being properly maintained over some time. 
So the, the structure of our presentation today will focus on the objective and context, which will just give us an overview of the refurbish operate and transfer program, which I will refer to as the ROTP during our session and the DPWI context within which this ROTP is being implemented. Then we'll address the program strategy, current progress and conclusions away for it. And I hope that we can do it within the shorter space of time so we can allow for interactions. So the, the program objectives really looks at how does the state begin to address improving office accommodation so that our client departments who depend on uh, public works and infrastructure for office space can deliver on their mandate so that we don't compromise but help to support and improve that and also use this program to promote spatial inclusivity, spatial integration and equitable access using our existing fixed assets. And then furthermore, promote sustainability and contribute uh, to the country's targets uh, pertaining to the uh, National Development Plan 2030 targets and sustainable development goals, uh, implementing this ROTP using our fixed assets. And the last two points is really around unlocking uh, national priorities by promoting economic development and driving inclusive uh, growth and job creation and the development of our, um, our assets. And then as a last part in a very strong pillar of this ROTP initiative is leveraging the collaboration between the public and the private sector in both the, the funding and the refurbishment and management of our fixed assets. So the context under which this program is being implemented, just to give you an overview, is that the department uh, currently has quite a large portfolio of assets under its uh, management. And these assets under, under management in the previous uh, financial years uh, report by the department were valued at over 134 billion rands. And that's really to show you the, the, the scale at which the department operates. But within this portfolio, about 62% of that portfolio is rated fair, poor, or very poor. And of that uh, portfolio that's rated poor and very poor, we are occupying 6,799 facilities out of the 90,000 facilities that we own as the state. And then furthermore, when you dig into the data, you find that 2,029 of those facilities as reported in the current financial year are actually not utilized, so unoccupied for various reasons. And then we have 1,042 facilities reported that are also illegally occupied. And what's important to note here is that these assets exclude assets that we own outside of South Africa or assets that are under the SOEs or other spheres of government, which just gives you to just give you uh, an indication that the extent of the asset portfolio by the state is quite large, uh, actually supersedes what's in the real estate investment trust market. The other context is the financial context, and that's just to show that the burden on the current budgeting processes does not allow us to really tackle the maintenance backlog that we have as a state. And so we believe the ROT uh, within this context will begin to help us make a dent in this maintenance backlog that we have. And this is just to show you that contextually, uh, even nationally, our budget deficit is at 386 billion rands as reported by, by the Ministry of Finance. But at the same time, as the state, we have been spending about 5.12 billion rands on operating leases, which has already been reported uh, by the minister in other sessions. And that money is being spent on privately owned assets. And so ROTP seeks to say, how do you then begin to spend money on your own assets as the state because you already have uh, fixed assets in your portfolio? So we are basically saying the current MTF budgeting cycle does not really give us the opportunity to make a dent into, the, into this estimated backlog maintenance. And if we don't do so, in the, if we continue using the current systems, uh, the backlog will only get worse. The other context is operational context. And this is just to give you a flavor that, I mean, as a state, we're really operating at a de facto industrial scale of uh, asset ownership and asset under management. The biggest um, real estate investment trust on the JSC right now, Growth Point, has assets of over 152 billion rands. And DPWI alone has 134 billion rand asset under management. The state has a much larger portfolio, more than that if you were to include the SOEs and other assets as I've already mentioned, which are not included in the presentation. So it's that context, but with that uh, size of an asset portfolio, we're still operating under the, the normal government department requirement operations. 
and expect it to, to maintain our assets to, to a satisfactory level. The other aspect is really around if we don't implement a, a robust program that begins to shift the needle, we are going to compromise service delivery. But the other bigger risk is that we're going to continue to degrade our assets. And this will be possibly irreversible over a long period of time. The other element is that the state has been hemorrhaging skills for quite some time, and a lot of those skills now lie in the private sector. So you are seeking a much better collaboration with the private sector so we can work together to really save our assets and protect them, focusing on value protection and value enhancement over time. And these challenges will continue to be there. And the last part is to encourage a culture of life cycle costing facilities management of our assets. So as a state, we don't just focus on capital expenditure, but really improve on our asset management capacity, which is an initiative that's been there for some time. And so the ROTP is saying, how do we take that forward and make it more of an embedded culture in the state? So the ROTP as a program and as a strategy seeks to then address some of these uh, factors that I've already highlighted. And the, the strategy itself is hinged on a long-term leasehold strategy, which is within the mandate of the department to address. And it's hinged on uh, these pillars of governance and implementation for the program, asset value protection and enhancement, uh, risk management and sustainability. And I'll just get into more detail of what those mean. So the long-term leasehold seeks to focus on unutilized and underutilized commercial buildings. And this is really with the understanding that in order to attract long-term leasing opportunities with the private sector, it has to be assets that they can be interested in and assets where it makes uh, economic sense for them to be involved with us in this type of program. And it'll also focus on improved value retention of existing assets. So it's basically saying the private sector comes in, we have a long-term leasehold agreement with them, but in that leasehold, there's an element of refurbishment of our facilities and also agreement on a facilities management program over an agreed period, depending on how the financial modeling works out for each and every single project. Institutionalization of sustainability principles. So this is where we look at, and I'll show you in a bit of detail, how we will uh, implement sustainability principles. And of course, overall, it's about encouraging reduced cost on FM, but also revenue enhancing strategies where possible. This is just a description of that detail. But most importantly, it's so saying that we'll be entering into long-term leases with a private sector for both refurbishment, maintenance, and managing and protecting our assets, which is very important. And also contributing to a transformed, inclusive, and vibrant active property market and being very robust around the transformation aspects. And as we've already said, the culture of life cycle costing is something that we want to embed in the ROTP to make sure that as the state invests money to its asset, we encourage a more long-term view in how we manage uh, the facilities management of our assets, both, both soft and, and hard facilities management. Then lastly, it's um, that this aligns with the department's plan to reduce uh, commercial leases with the, with the private sector. So it will actually be leasing our assets, but will be occupying our assets, and which is a very important point to make. Then on the sustainability part, it's really the main focus on consumption patterns, reduction of use, and contingency plans and possible embedded generation in our buildings, which aligns with other programs that the department is working on. Efforts will also focus on the DPWI's business continuity processes. So this is elements of really utilizing our assets with the lessons that we've learned from COVID, but also lessons that the department was already embarking on using uh, examples like hot desking, where it's not necessarily that uh, people use fixed spaces all the time, and that will allow us to improve efficiency of use of our spaces. And then we'll incorporate uh, economies of scale principles in the socioeconomic maximization model, where the state is using its muscle and ownership to drive down the cost of uh, maintenance over time, because we can better negotiate with the private sector because of the extent of the portfolio that we have. Part of the risk management is that we will utilize the SIS methodology, uh, which is we're already utilizing as part of ESA's process of ensuring that the state manages its risk when it's implementing projects. And the SIS methodology really looks at one, being able to make a case for a project being implemented, but also ensuring that it's affordable and making sure that you implement uh, suitable procurement models when implementing these projects. 
and ensuring that you've got the right capacity when you're implementing the project and align this with the revenue approved for accommodation and charges in consultation with Treasury. And then importantly is that post-occupancy, one has to have periodical reviews of these facilities to ensure there's alignment with the agreed contracts with the private sector. End of concession period requirements will focus on ensuring that in the agreements we have with the, with the participants, that at least the assets at the end of the concession period will be in the state that will still be reusable, but the state will have an opportunity to either re-enter or re-bid um, the contracts or take on this FM services as the state, uh, as the state uh, capacity improves over time. Governance, uh, ESA has been given uh, the responsibility within uh, DPWI to work as the lead on the project, but of course we're working in partnership with the various uh, divisions within Public Works, but importantly with our user departments and the market and ensuring that we can align uh, the strategy and ensure that we also um, carry out the, the needs that the client department have given to us that we ensure that this forms part of the program. And importantly is that this will also be strategically monitored under the Strategic Integrated Projects uh, Government Precinct to ensure that there's line of sight, uh, both from a strategic level in government, but also within the department. And this of course will require a robust uh, project office. And already we've started within ESA to work on this, on this project. And you'll see now how the strategy will be, will be implemented and the work is already ongoing as we speak. So the current progress and update is that we have uh, decided to take on this program uh, in a pilot phase to make sure that there's a uh, proof of concept and ensure that we uh, can capture lessons learned as we implement the program because the asset base as we've indicated is quite large. And so it wouldn't be wise to just go to the market with the full asset base without really testing the concept using the pilot phase. So we've selected Telcom Towers Precinct in the CBD of Tswane, Public Works House and Civitas Building, which will be implemented in phases. And then phase two will be going out to 200 to 300 facilities that we own, which will meet the criteria that I've already stated around uh, buildings that will attract participation of the, of the private sector. And importantly here is that we will also use uh, strategies to impact space use efficiency, which is aligned to the point that we made around um, business process efficiencies where we will learn from how uh, commercial markets are also using their spaces uh, efficiently now post COVID and how it's not necessarily permanent usage of space all the time and how they can also be integrated use of space between the different departments. The, the, the current status uh, of these buildings that we'll be implementing is indicated on this slide. This is just give you a flavor of the type of uh, scale that we're working with and the type of ideas that we have and also the, the type of problems that we are really facing. This is really from the pre-feasibility assessment. And as part of the program, as you'll see in the next slides, we are now embarking on a much more um, detailed condition assessment and this process is ongoing. We will prepare detailed condition assessments for the market to take uh, and use as a baseline for them to be able to, to bid on providing us a solution for the refurbishment and maintenance of our facilities. The, the program is currently stand estimated timelines. Uh, we have already uh, begun engaging legal uh, services so that we can ensure, as I said, in the system methodology, part of risk management is to ensure that we select the right procurement method. And we've already started with um, the early business case process, which is part of the system methodology. We've started as well with the condition assessments uh, internally to make sure that we create that baseline for the market. And at the moment, we are pushing along. And when we have confirmed that legal uh, opinion with the, with the legal firms and legal experts, we'll be able to then concretize uh, the timelines for the procurement. But at the moment, this is where they stand. And we will continue to work uh, with the team to ensure that we, we, we make sure we implement the correct uh, measures in implementing the program. But that will be phase 1A, which is uh, targeted for this uh, financial year. Phase 1B will start in the next financial year. And in the next financial year, we'll also begin to do high level analysis of the facilities those 200 to 300 facilities I, I mentioned, that those will then be uh, selected, prioritized, and the right criteria implemented so that we select buildings that are suitable for the market to engage in. 
at the moment, current milestones, I've already kind of mentioned it. And where we are at the moment is really ensuring that we create the correct baseline for the market, which is the detailed condition assessment. And then we get into procurement. And this will be uh, an RFI and RFP procurement, which refers to requests for information and requests for proposals. And this will allow us at least to make sure that we have technically sound bids and technically sound teams that will ensure to implement these programs. So that when you get to the request for proposal stage, you have selected suitable candidates that can implement this program and have the right, uh, the right skills, the right capacity, and have taken on uh, the right serviceability aspects in their financing and collateral, et cetera. In conclusion, the, the, the program itself, uh, we believe, has uh, great benefits for the state as a whole in that uh, we'll, of course, begin to learn a lot more around this long-term and life cycle implementation of facilities management in partnership with the private sector. And the program as a whole will, con will contribute to us being able to match uh, the use of our assets for other unmet needs from other spheres of government. And... Furthermore, the optimization of this uh, fixed asset portfolio under the, the custodianship of DPWI can also contribute to revenue generating opportunities once we have established the different uses of our assets and also the different needs that our user departments have uh, over time. And in the long term, this program will contribute to value retention and enhancement of the portfolio, which is really the drive to say we cannot allow our assets to continue to degrade over time. And this program is driving us towards that and, and, and hopefully then uh, will also contribute to the initiative uh, towards the improved financial and asset management sustainability of our property management trading entity. And lastly, we believe that this may also begin to allow for possible policy reviews around the consolidation of the entire state-owned asset fixed portfolio, including assets owned by the state in foreign countries. Uh, with that, uh, honorable chair and honorable members, uh, Minister and Deputy Minister, uh, I thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Tabang. Um, uh, Mandy, can you put it on record that when we started with the presentation, uh, two other members had joined the meeting. That means that when we started, we were correcting. Um, so please put that on record um, as you indicated in the message that you sent to me that we are correcting. Thank you, yes. uh, Tabang. Any additions, uh, Minister? Yes, uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, I'm told that yesterday, uh, Honorable Chairperson made reference to Telcom Towers. Now, this is not the same, tel it is part of the Telcom Towers. We will come back to the committee and report on the Telcom Towers building that was uh, refurbished for the South African Police Services. As part of that Telcom Towers precinct, there are three empty office buildings. Um, and, and those are the three office empty office buildings that will buildings that will become part of the refurbish operate and transfer. So I just wanted to make give that clarity. And then the the second one on policy um, is also very important here. And we will initiate this process. Now the government immovable asset management act of 2007. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, that uh, there were never regulations uh, prepared uh, for, for the Act. So we are also busy with uh, drafting regulations uh, for Guiama, and that will also assist us, especially with future policy development. The world has changed, the property market is changing on a daily basis. COVID-19 had had a major impact on how office space is being utilized. So we will start with our policy and research unit to begin to do more research to see what is happening also in the rest of the world. And then uh, before the end of this year, we will start the policy process 
uh, that Tabang is making uh, reference to the possible um, policy reviews. So that is still work in progress, Chairperson, that, that we are busy with. But uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, uh, Minister. Um, Honourable members, let's also uh, listen to IDT so that when we interact with our reports, we interact with them, uh, all of them, not to deal with one report at a time. Uh, Honourable Trink uh, also will be boarding a flight, uh, I think around two, so she will leave, he will leave our meeting then, but currently he is in. Can we then get uh, IGT? Uh, good afternoon, Honourable Chair. Afternoon, Honourable Minister, uh, Deputy Minister, my colleagues. My name is Zimbini Hill, and I'm the interim chairperson at the IDT. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present to you today. Mine is a short task. I've got with me our acting CEO, Teboho, and she will introduce her team. Um, we uh, Maybe one word for me is that we really value the partnership that we have with uh, the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure. And we're quite honored and quite excited to be part of the journey of re rejuvenating um, uh, the public infrastructure and also being part of the process to ensure that it's sustainable and is well maintained. Uh, with that, I'll hand over to our acting CEO, Teboho. Um, thank you very much, um, acting chairperson of the board. Um, good day, Honorable Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee, Honorable Minister, and Honorable Members of the Portfolio Committee. Um, I am here with um, my Executive Program Management Services Unit, Mr. Dumisho Makofani. Can we please have sharing rights so that we can share the presentation from our side? Yes, you've been made co-host. Okay. Um, thank you, thank you, CEO. Um, good, good afternoon, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members, uh, Minister, Deputy Minister, Chair of the IDT, Acting CEO of the IDT, colleagues at DPWI, and ESA. Um, Chair, I will be taking you through the presentation on the draft Total Facilities Management Strategy. Um, which we have created in partnership with um, the Department of Public Works, or in consultation rather, with the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure. Chair, the, 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 the presentation is very, is very short. It will give us, that's the outline, it's the purpose, it's the different uh, maintenance strategies, it's the institutional delivery system, it's the sustainability report, and it's the sample of um, uh, projects. Um, when we look at the purpose of this um, particular presentation, it's in line with the request from the committee um, with regards to the alignment of IDT's maintenance strategy with that of the DPWI, um, the development of the TFM, which is the Total Facilities Management um, 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 Strategy, and that's how I will refer to it um, for the duration of the presentation. Um, which strategy will focus on preventative culture rather than um, repair later. So um, a, pre a preventative maintenance rather than reactive or ad hoc maintenance. And then, of course, how will that strategy um, increase the revenue for the IDT during the 2022-23 financial year and beyond? Um, next is the maintenance strategies. So. When you look at um, the, the uh, graphic before you, it's a graphic that shows where, where we currently are, where we are saying we're probably in a, an erect, a reactive mode and want to be in a proactive mode where we eliminate the defects and re redesign um, uh, the value focus. So this particular graphic, um, Chair, 
and uh, honorable members, it's really a guide uh, for us in terms of developing the, the DPWI strategy. When, when, when we finalize that um, strategy, we, we will um, take into account the National Immovable Asset Maintenance Management Framework, which will then uh, accompany this guide and then put uh, a form part of the final strategy. In terms of the draft maintenance strategy, I've also I've, 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 I've mentioned um, the National Immovable Asset Management um, Framework and National Strategy. And when you look at the strategy, it talks to the earlier presenters' uh, presentation on the ROTP strategy. And you will see that there is an alignment between the two, because once those buildings are done um, from an ROTP strategy, you need to have maintenance. So, it talks to the next bullet point that says maintenance occurs after construction and it is and is um, ongoing on immovable asset. And um, this draft maintenance strategy strives, strives to be proactive rather than reactive, as I mentioned uh, earlier on, and that it will, it will make sure that uh, we've got well-maintained assets in accordance with uh, best value principles. The assets are efficient and effective, functional and operational, and all statutory and technical requirements of health and safety, security, and reliability are met. And, and, and the last point really talks to, to reduction of litigations that happen from time to time because um, assets are not well maintained. We then look at um, some of the programs that we have previously done as the IDT. Um, that is just a sample of the programs. It's not all the programs that we've done. Uh, between the last uh, five to 10 years, and um, they, told, they come to a total of 1.5 um, billion. Um, the IDT's response to the maintenance strategy um, is a three-pronged response. It looks at the institutional capacity, and I think of key importance is that the, the total facilities management strategy will align to the IDMS and the CIDP, CIDB legislative framework. And, and then, of course, IDT is institution, institutionalizing IDMS for all aspects of delivery of programs currently. So, so we are aligned in terms of that program. And then the social impact, job creation. I think that is, that is a very important aspect for, 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 for all of us. Um, we know that um, the unemployment rate uh, is uh, very high. And this strategy also aims to address, to address amongst other things, that. And, and, and I'll talk to that later in terms of what is the plan? And of course, the political and ad administrative um, um, leg. Um, with regards to institutional delivery systems, that is the model that um, we, 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 we would like to adopt. We'd like to obviously assess uh, the current management practices, assess the current state of assets, um, and then we plan in terms of how do we then asset with regards to the asset management policy, the asset management strategy, and, 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 and you'll realize that with regards to what I'm presenting, we are probably running a parallel process where a team will assess and a team will be busy with a strategy, which strategy will then um, go back to the assessment. And, 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 I'm, and I think this particular um, model is, is self-explanatory that it, it, it's interactive, so it's not a start to finish process. We have to revisit it from time to time and take stock in terms of where are we with regards to this, um, with regards to this uh, strategy and the, uh, um, against the framework. In terms of developing this um, strategy, we are saying we'll look at the applicable um, legislation and guidelines. So the strategy is guided by three, three um, principles, really. Um, the first one is guided by uh, the PM BOC, which is the program management body of knowledge, and that talks to the 10 areas of how, how we execute um, projects. And we also look at the IDMS, and, and, and I've made reference to the IDMS earlier on, uh, and the FIFDIM, the Framework for Infrastructure Delivery and Pro Program Management. And this will be then in compliance, the strategy will be compliance with Guillama. I think Minister has made reference to Guillama just now in her, in her remarks of 2007. And it will be in compliance with the CIDB guidelines and the standard uniformity for engineering and construction contracts. We then say the development approach of the IDT is that um, there will be an in-house team 
which will be made up of maintenance and of facilities management team competency. So we'll have to recruit seasoned personnel as well as uh, capacitating the current team that we have. And that has already started, um, honorable chair and honorable members. The community, um, we will we'll have to look at the social facilitation approach. How do we then bring them into this um, strategy? Because we have buildings uh, in various um, areas of um, the country. The skills development program is what I referred to earlier on. And I think this is a very important program uh, um, that we should not take for granted, which we, we would like to do with the relevant CETAs, uh, construction CETA in, in the main, CIDB, National Skills um, Fund, and the Tivet Colleges to, to assure that there's quality and adherence to standards and obviously the skills development uh, in, in that regard. And then the contractor development is outside the skills development where we've got contractors that would then also participate in the term contracts and then the EPWP, which you might all be aware that IDT has excelled over the, the, the previous years in executing this particular program. And we, we believe that we have the expertise working together with the DPWI um, to execute um, this program through the strategy. And the sustainability plan is that currently, uh, well, let, let me start with by saying that the Honorable Minister has made a, 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 a commitment through the shareholder compact and has been supportive in this regard in making sure that um, the IDT remains sustainable and has given her support together with the Deputy Minister um, with, this, with, this, with this particular regard. As it stands now, we're sitting on a current portfolio of 4.5 billion. And we are saying that if uh, we are to look at maintenance programs, we would we would look would look at a program at you know, a portfolio in the range of two billion, that would also assist um, the IDT in breaking even, and therefore uh, making sure that um, we remain um, sustainable over o o over the years and 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 and, and of course addressing the, the the other issues that I, I alluded to earlier on. The action plan for the maintenance programs that um, we we'll look at the mentorship. Uh, I've mentioned the, the experienced personnel within the maintenance and facilities management uh, arena, which we, we are aiming to recruit. We're looking at a facilities management unit, and I think that's, that, that's very key uh, if this, the, this strategy is to be executed uh, effectively and efficiently within the IDT, uh, IDT's unit of the PMSU, and obviously working together with the DPWI on, um, on this unit and devoted out uh, devoted funding out for the maintenance vote. I have mentioned that earlier, and then the social benefits thereof. Um, one of the key things is always how do we then manage um, and know which where to do maintenance uh, and the frequency thereof and 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 so on. So we are in the in the in the process of uh, a management system, and this is just a proposed maintenance management system. It doesn't talk to um, everything in its, its, in, 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 in its entirety. Um, we know that um, a system uh, at times uh, it's a trial and error. So currently there are a lot of things that we are currently doing internally to make sure that when we go out to the market and procure a system, it's a system that will, will be interlinked and it will address um, um, all the issues that have been raised by both IDT and DPWI. And the last slide, really, um, Chair, is just um, a, a, a pictures of the maintenance work that we've been doing at um, the Correctional Services. So we do have a program that we are doing together with um, the Department of Correctional Services. And um, the picture at the bottom, for, argument, uh, for, for instance, um, refers to the boilers that have been recently maintained and or um, maintained and refurbished. So these are just some of the projects that we've done amongst um, the ones that I mentioned earlier on. And uh, in that chair, I'd like to thank you and um, the honorable members and the colleagues for listening. Uh, thank you. Uh, Minister, any additions? Uh, oh, yes, yes, uh, honorable. CEO, yes. thank you very much I know for that the opportunity. You, you, you're soon going to leave us, yes. Uh, 
Honorable Chairperson, um, we all are aware about the backlog of maintenance of state-owned buildings in our country. Uh, our country is littered with uh, buildings that need maintenance, that we have failed to maintain over the years. And so there's definitely a lot of work to do for all of us. And uh, therefore, I, as my mandate is, have reviewed the policy on, uh, uh, infra on, on, on maintenance within the department. And out of the policy comes then a strategy that DPWI is in the process of developing. That strategy will be done by the end of September. And when we are going to allocate any work to any implementing agency, whether it's IDT or KUHA or DBSA, it will have to follow the maintenance strategy of DPWI. And therefore, we are also engaging uh, in the next week or so with IDT to align the IDT strategy to the DPWI strategy so that we have uniformity of maintenance all over the country where we are going to do maintenance. And also we want to ensure also consistency in, in the way we deal with um, maintenance. Uh, the, the proper specifications uh, will be included for maintenance will be included in any maintenance service level agreement with any of the entities because it also need to be uh, tightened up. Also, what we have found in the past, uh, honorable members, is that we, in our service level agreement with the, uh, any implementing agency, uh, and I have been consulted with the with DBSA and KUHA already, we must still do the consultation with, um, with IDT. Um, we're also going to uh, include in our service level agreement KPIs and clear deliverables. And the intention also is that where we are going to release funding for maintenance, it will be released in tranches measured against the deliverables. And that is the advice that we also got from the, um, the Auditor General that we need to strengthen our um, alignment and, and, and work with, with all implementing agencies. So key in this whole strategy is the overlay of IT on everything that we are going to do. There's going to be no manual this, manual that, that takes ages to be done. So the, 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 the infrastructure, I mean, the maintenance um, uh, information technology uh, that, uh, that we, we, we are busy designing will be overlay over any strategy. And that will make sure that we really bring the, the maintenance program of government to the standard of the maintenance program in the private sector. Uh, I, for instance, look at uh, the, some of the banks, uh, their maintenance strategies, uh, where they have got office, I mean, where they've got bank branches all over the country, how they maintain those branches. So, so we've done a lot of research to make sure that we can match the quality and standards of the private sector to make sure uh, when we do maintenance, we, we reach that uh, quality of, of, of standard. So um, once uh, DPWI is finished with, with our first draft, like I say, we will engage with IDT, we will engage with uh, KUHA, we will engage with DBSA because they, it, there's just enough work uh, for all the implementing agencies. There is enough work for DPWI maintenance because of the backlog of maintenance. So we really want to upscale the maintenance project 
um, uh, DPWI has not done very well, especially on our spend of our maintenance budget, but also we overspend on our maintenance budget. So, so hopefully with the new uh, policy and the new strategy, honorable members, we will be able to arrest the, the lack of maintenance of, of government owned buildings. We also spend a lot of money, honorable members, on uh, um, employing private security companies to guard these buildings so that they are not further vandalized. So the project is quite urgent, um, and that's why I've put the deadline for the end of September so that you will see in our new budget for the next financial year that facilities management uh, maintenance will be packaged completely differently so that we can catch up with, with the backlog across our country. So those are just a few points for me, uh, Honorable Chairperson, work in progress. I thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, I now invite uh, honorable members to deliberate on the two presentations um, as, as presented uh, by the ESA team and IGT team. Okay. Um, Minister, I don't know whether uh, uh, Dr. Ramahopa has currently joined us. And I think in your apologies, you didn't mention that, whether he won't be here or whatever. Uh, I, 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 I will establish that, uh, Honorable Chairperson, because I know that he is joining me uh, tomorrow in, in Prisca, and I know you also had to fly to Kimberley. But I will establish that after the meeting, and then I will come back to Honorable Chairperson and the members. Thank you. I think you understand, Minister, that uh, yes. um, even yourself, you have to take uh, the business of the portfolio committee very serious. So when there is no apology, then we... Yes, no, I agree with you. Okay, okay, okay. I will, I will, I will keep that. Thank you. Okay. Um, then I will note hands, uh, Honorable Sewis, I will be the first one, Honorable Graham Murray, the second one, Honorable Hicklin, the third one. Those are the hands that I can see. Uh, Honorable Franz Kalvik, the fourth one, Honorable Matebula, the fifth one. In that order, Honorable Members, uh, Chair, I was going to make a suggestion. Uh, Honorable Tring is leaving at two. If he wants to take a bite, I'll come after him. Uh, Honorable Tring didn't even raise Thank you, his sir. head. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Chia, I didn't want his head. to. Okay, Chia, I didn't let's, want let's, to. Honorable I didn't Tring, want any, to because... anything that you would like to say? Yes, Chair, I think that, that there is. I uh, didn't want to raise my hand because of my limited time, but thank you to Honorable Suisa for uh, affording me the opportunity. Um, Chia, I think just maybe one or two questions. Uh, first one is, how, how are we going to see the integration? Um, obviously, I came in midstream on the ROT uh, presentation uh, and, and liked what I, what I heard, uh, even though I came in, came in midstream. Um, but again, the ROT presentation as well as the IDT presentation also speaks about the importance of our asset register. Um, so, so the question is, how are we integrating um, and ensuring that, number one, we actually do have an asset register base um, from which to, to work off one that is up to date um, and, and, one, and one that is complete. So I think that that is, that is my, first, my first question. The second question would be uh, just with regards to systems and programs in place, Corruption Watch has just uh, put out a, a statement indicating that within the education sector, for example, particularly with the procurement processes, um, there's a huge amount of corruption uh, that is taking place within the education sector. Now we're building schools and, and libraries and such like, um, but within, within the building of those and the procurement um, of, of these buildings um, or the, the tenders, um, 
Corruption Watch indicates that there's a huge amount of, this is SAFM this, this, uh, this morning, huge amount of corruption that is taking place. Um, how are we again going to put in place uh, measures to ensure that uh, we do not have uh, these illegal procurement processes taking place? So two questions essentially, Chair. Uh, one is, is on the asset manager, uh, the asset management register, and uh, the other is uh, just proper procurement processes um, throughout the, the, the departments and our entities. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Honorable Tring. Um, you really are looked for by Honorable Suisa. Uh, uh, we will then follow the, the, um, the, the, the line of hands that I, uh, I raised earlier on, Honorable Suisa being the first one, followed by Honorable Graham Mare, Honorable Hicklin, Honorable Franz Kalvik, Honorable Matebula, Honorable Jobo, in that order, please, Honorable Members. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I was listening to the presentation and also going through the slides themselves, and I'm a bit concerned. Um, we've got ESA, we've got IDT, both of them have got the same scope of work, which I find in common, which is maintenance. And now the question that's going to be raised is, and I think this is a question I've raised many numerous times to find out what is our role over infrastructure South Africa? Taking into consideration that the Department of Public Works, some of the money comes from the Department of, Pub Department of Public Works, and we have a role to do oversight over any entity that falls under a, a Department of Public Works or that is funded by Department of Public Works. In slide five of the ISA, uh, uh, of the, is it slide, slide four of the ISA presentation, where they talk about property maintenance, 2.1 billion was already spent. And when we go around, we don't know where this 2.1 was spent. Maybe if we can be given the courtesy to say, this is where we've spent the, 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 the 2.1 billion. Uh, um, the other one would be on, we, we talk about slide three also on the ISA presentation. 1,875 unused, unutilized buildings in 2021. This year it has gone up to 2029 in 2022. And we've got all of these buildings that are just standing there, which can, could, should have been refurbished given to the sister departments for them to utilize them because that's the role of the of the dpwi to make sure that we do have uh, all of those buildings being functional and being utilized all these buildings must be given over to the department of higher education and technology to accommodate our students who don't have accommodation slide 11 appointment of expert firms at what cost they are going to appoint expert firms at what cost is this going to be done, which means that we are going to spend more money on outsourcing work that should be done by personnel that is within the, within the DPWI. And then when I go to the IDT, I, I want to applaud to say it's Women's Month and two women from IDT were actually present. I think that one we need to applaud and say, uh, we are very proud as women. The TFM implementation, what are the time frames for each phase or strategy that they are talking about in, in slide 10? And what intervention is going to be put? Is there an intervention plan or consequence management plan that's going to be put in place to end if one of the phases that they are talking or strategies they are talking about do not actually meet their target. What do they have in, 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 in plan to make sure that everything runs smoothly? If something does not go right, this is what they are going to do. For now, those are my only questions, uh, Chair. Oh, and then the minister spoke about 
private security companies. And so we are again going to spend money that is not there to get private security companies. Because if these buildings are occupied, then we don't need to have any security. Each and every department can have their own security to make sure that their buildings are kept. But if they are going to be maintained and refurbished and they are not occupied, like some of the houses in the Eastern Cape that where I received a, an, an email to say that there's a house of public works which is being vandalized in the Eastern Cape and it's not being utilized. People want to buy the house because it's, it's just sitting there. Then we are going to have a problem. We are going to refurbish and maintain and do whatever that we want to do. And then the building is going to stand empty and then it's going to be vandalized again. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Suvisa. Honorable Graham Mare. Um, good afternoon, Chair. Thank you very much. And afternoon to everybody who presented, to the Minister and um, the members from the dep various departments. Um, I'm going to start off just by saying that it's unfortunate the acronym that we're using um, because it actually um, is evidence of where we're at and not where we're going to because um, the acronym is ROT. Um, so I think we should try and keep the P in as long as possible and call it the ROTP. Uh, ROT ROTP, as opposed to just referring to it as, as ROT. Um, and then I just want to do, uh, just, just on a generalized thing, and I and I agree with some of the points that, that Honorable Suisa has raised, um, in terms of the, the um, properties that are standing empty, um, there are a large number of those. And I know we're having a meeting later on in the term to discuss ideas around that, because there are a lot of organizations that have approached me about properties that are standing empty that, that can be utilized um, for various various um, things, so I think I think that's something that has to be built into whatever strategy we we're looking at in terms of under or unutilized properties. We need to then build in another strategy around um, how these can the ones that we cannot afford to refurbish or that are not worth refurbishing. How we can find a way of of passing those on to other people who might have ideas around it. Um, so this needs to be maybe just um, also included in, in the strategy is ideas around other properties that don't necessarily entail us doing the work, um, but find us um, finding tenants for them that, that benefit the communities. So one of the questions I wanted to ask is, um, currently with the PMTE, are our leases cost reflective? In other words, are we building into the cost per square meter a maintenance element um, that can then be used to offset the maintenance that's required on the buildings? And if not, why not? Isn't it something that we should be looking at um, with respect to the, the leases that we use? The other problem we have is that we have devolved some of the um, properties um, and the day-to-day -day management of properties to some of the sister departments, um, correctional services being one of those. What's happening there is that people don't under, the departments don't necessarily understand their role and function in terms of maintenance. So where they have to do day-to-day -day maintenance up to 100,000 Rand um, and Public Works does repair and refurbishment, this is not being properly communicated, it's not being properly agreed to. Um, and so because they don't have a genuine understanding of what happens or what is required, they're not fixing things and our properties are running to rack and ruin. A prime example is there's a housing estate on the Bluff in Durban um, where members of the military stay. And the place is an absolute shambles and it's affecting neighbors because walls are collapsing into neighbors' gardens, et cetera. And there's just this whole issue around who's responsible for what and what their roles are. So I think it's very, very important that any lease that we enter into um, now going forward requires that there's clarity around who's responsible for what and that whoever is leasing the property has a facilities maintenance company or or department in place that can address those things with, with proper um, outcomes, et cetera, like the minister was talking about. So I think that's something that's really, really critical. Um, slide 10, we spoke about the DPW Associate Economic Maximization Model. I've never seen that. I've never heard about it. So um, there were actually two, two documents that were referred to or policies that were referred to, um, and there's an additional one that I would like to request. So I'd like to request that we please be sent and the socioeconomic maximization model so that we have an idea of what that means, because to my understanding, that would mean how we are utilizing our properties to, to, to garner socioeconomic benefit. Um, 
I'd like us to get a copy of the letting out strategy because I think that's super important, particularly like in our small harbors where we've got leases there that need to be renewed or we've got properties that we can let out. We need to know what the strategy is around that and whether or not we are building in a maintenance element to that. Um, and then also there was the immovable asset um, maintenance. I mean, that was the world's longest title of a document, that, that maintenance um, document as well. If we could get those sent out, appreciate that. I agree with Honourable Siwisa. Um, I'm very concerned about um, the oversight element with ESA because aspects of ESA are, are um, embedded in DPWI and other aspects are embedded in, in the PRCC and a lot of the interactions are with the DBSA with whom we don't have um, oversight um, capacity. So um, we need to look at how, how the reporting to this committee happens on behalf of ESA. Um, and then... Um, uh, Honourable Siwisa also raised the question around the panel. I also want to know who is that panel? Um, how is it identified? How are the various businesses identified that will form part of that panel? And again, my question also was around what is the cost? And then in terms of the um, uh, PPP regulations, I know that those are being amended currently. They're reviewing those regulations. Um, are we going to wait until those regulations have been reviewed so that we we make sure that we are um you know we are compliant with those? Um how how much um leeway will we have in terms of those those regulations? Um and and one of the problems I have is that you spoke about RFIs and RFQs, and we're talking about millions and billions of rands, and surely that requires tender processes and not just RFIs and RFQs. So um, you said that you're seeking legal advice in terms of the procurement, um, and I think that we need to be kept up to speed on and whether or not the, um, everything is being done fully in compliance, because we know procurement is obviously um, the biggest area for, for corruption. Um, and then just in terms of the IDT slides, I love the idea of that um, IT-based maintenance management system. I think it's a brilliant idea. And that's where I think we need to, to integrate when, when if, if, if IDT is doing the maintenance or when we sign a lease or whoever's doing the maintenance, that DPWI is, is feeding into that even for other leases so that people are, are aware of what the requirements are with respect to maintenance. Um, one of the other issues that I think we need to look at quite seriously with respect to, to maintenance is heritage. Um, heritage is a specialized maintenance program that has to be done, even for the day-to-day -day issues. So what we're seeing, for example, there's a, a police station in Cliplot in my constituency. It's a little tiny town. It's a little tiny police station. They get issues that come up that they've got to repair. The public works then appoints contractors. These are not heritage specialists. So they come in and they fix stuff and they fix it wrong because it doesn't it doesn't work with the, the materials with which so it's a sandstone build, it's a sandstone building, or there's you know special wood or whatever. They're not appointing heritage contractors to repair, refurbish, or even maintain the buildings. So I think the heritage element is something that needs to be looked at quite seriously. There are a lot of heritage buildings um, that are owned by the, by the department that need to be addressed. Um, and then obviously, um, you know, we've got issues with SAPS stations that are not, SAPS is another area where, where the um, maintenance has been devolved um, and they are not doing day-to-day -day maintenance because their budgets don't allow for it and they're not adhering to whatever budget allocations there are. And these, and then the SAP station gets into such a state that it becomes a DPWI issue because it's now requiring over 100,000 rand for repairs and, and refurbishment. So um, there has to be far greater collaboration. And that's where possibly IDT can step in as a facilities manager um, and address either the day-to-day -day management and or the repair and refurbishment side of things. So um, all in all, I think it's it's very exciting that we, we're we going in the direction we're going. Um, but I think there's going to have to be, um, it's going to have to be more overarching than it is currently. I think in some ways, I feel like we're looking a little bit into a silo. Um, we're working in silos as opposed to looking at an overarching strategy that addresses all the issues. Thank you very much for the for the opportunity. Thank you, Honourable Graham Murray. Honourable Higley. Thanks so much, Chair. Um, yes, I am going to go a little bit on to two of my hobby horses, one of which being the Immovable Asset Register, um, because we 
have seen the department invest so much money in the Archibus system and the integration of uh, the immovable asset register from Sage to Archibus. And now we're talking about something completely different again. So now we are looking at a new system and we have invested, I think the last figure, I mean, we were banding figures around and in my head it was going from 48 to 63 to 80 million rand that has already been invested. And now we're looking at something else again. And I'm just concerned that that Archibus is not working or has only been implemented on certain platforms and now we're looking at something else and where has the money gone that we have invested on that and how is it going to now move into this new system that we are now looking at um, in terms of the immovable asset register and do we have a fully functional immovable asset register that can now tell us that in 2021 we had so many buildings, but in our 2022 we have this number of buildings. Those are illegal, those weren't illegal, these are registered correctly. Are we now saying that we have a fully functional immovable asset register and can I, not, can I really now get excited about it? Because I People in front of me have lost you. Been calling me about Honorable Hitlin. pieces of land and buildings that I have been escalating. Leanne knows exactly how many queries I have put through to her buildings that are being abused. I'm having such stigma. Am I back? Have I come you are You are back, but we lost you earlier on. Okay, I'm going to switch my video off to see if it makes us the, uh, the, okay. the signal stronger. Okay, so as I was saying, there are so many pieces of land and buildings in Fochville, for example. I have others in my constituency in Midrand, and I have others in Swane. They are, again, like um, Honourable Graham Marais has said, they are heritage buildings, the glass houses at the Union buildings, the bell towers in the Union buildings. There are so many issues of maintenance within the DPWI that we cannot get addressed. The whole of Tabat Swane, the issues of maintenance within... Um, Swane that are not being addressed because we we don't know into which area, into which department, whether it's defense, whether it's DPWI that are actually responsible for, for looking at the maintenance that we have to decide on who is responsible. Is it refurbishment? Is it um, maintenance? that we have to decide on. It's wonderful that we are now getting our ducks in a row. I hope they are all flying in the same direction. Um, and we have to actually make sure that what we are looking at is all coming from one department. So it, I agree with Honorable Graham Marie that we need to refurbish, operate, transfer together as a collective, as opposed to making it operate in, in, in a silo that, that we are not working hand in hand with different entities and different um, departments. So it would be great if we could get a cohesion and not work separately and not work on our own. But the, for me, the fundamental is that we have good oversight over the entire operation and that we know that we have a solid immovable asset register that has tracked every building, that has tracked every piece of land, because if we have that, then we have a solid base to work off. And my other point that I'd like to make is we need to look at the business models that the likes of the growth points and the likes of a pan golding, your property trading entities, that look at leases. We need to see what they are doing right, what they are doing well, that will enable us to model the way the 
um, PMTE should be working because at the moment, as I said yesterday, we are only a property management agent. We are not a property management trading entity because we are not able to get money from the people who lease buildings from us because we're not working optimally. And I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Hicklin. Honorable Van Scalve. Thank you very much, Chairperson. And good afternoon to the Honorable Chairperson, Minister in absentia, De Deputy Minister, our uh, Honorable Members as well as the, the departmental officials. Chairperson, when, when looking at slide 17 uh, of the IDT presentation, I see that they are mentioning that they want to develop a maintenance system. But I, uh, even though I, I'm, I'm thinking this might be a duplication in terms of, of there also being a removal asset register, but I, I would, uh, would, would, would uh, strongly suggest, Chairperson, that uh, we have a seamless uh, process or management system across the different spheres of government, like your national, provincial, and municipal levels, whereby we can pool the funds, the ICT funds, in developing one system across the, the different departments, across the, the, the different spheres of government. And I think that's going to save costs, but it would also be more effective in the long run. Then in terms of the ISA uh, presentation on slide three, I see that they are mentioning 1,042 facilities recorded as being illegally occupied. Can we get some clarification in this regard of, of, of what's happening there? Because it's, it's really a point of concern to me in this regard. Uh, when, when looking at, at ISACHE, I, I see the way that they are doing things uh, uh, are quite good in terms of, of uh, uh, a staff, their staff complement, in terms of the competencies, in terms of the level of education, in terms of the experience of their staff. And, and I would have thought, uh, Chairperson, that that's exactly what, what our uh, department needs. Uh, to copy that model in terms of PMTE and also IDT, so that we have uh, uh, staff that's in place that would be able to, to, to be effective and efficient uh, and competent in terms of their expertise. Uh, so so uh, that, that's really something that, that we, we can emulate as, as the department. So, uh, Chairperson, the other issue is in terms of uh, they are mentioning uh, that they're going to have a socioeconomic maximization model. And I'm, I'm just wondering what are the main pillars of, of such a model and over which branches does this model would stretch? And what is the role then of the regional offices per province? Uh, and I, I also request that if it's possible to include the training of in-house artisans to, to create such, uh, uh, create jobs uh, through the socioeconomic maximization model. Uh, then chairperson, when, when uh, uh, looking at, at, at what has, has, has been presented, I, I strongly feel that I might be wrong, but I strongly feel that many of, 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 of the tasks that were performed by, or that's currently supposed to be performed by PMT in IDT, it's been taken over by, by ISA. And, and I would therefore uh, think that it, it, it uh, uh, would be better chairperson if IDT and PMTE still uh, performs their duties, uh, but but we need to see that uh, the, the the for instance like ISA performing uh, uh, more larger uh, infrastructure projects and leave the the PMTE and IDT 
to perf to to uh, be operationalized and staff with properly qualified and experienced staff that manages the IRA and trades on 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 its value, and to 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 perform jobs uh, uh, in terms of 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 of, of uh, the communities and 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 uh, whereby they take over the com. Uh, uh, assist communities in terms of job creation and those small, small kind of, 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 of projects. I think, let, let me uh, pause there, uh, Chairperson, thank you very much, but uh, otherwise I've been covered by the previous speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Van Skalveik. Honorable Machabula. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, my greetings to you, the Minister. Uh, the whip of the committee, uh, members of the uh, portfolio committee and uh, staff. Um, so, well, mine is brief. So, well, uh, so, well, it's on the report that was presented to us by the ROTP. I uh, must first uh, to, um, welcome the report and uh, indicate to this meeting that uh, um, it will go a long way in helping this department, especially in discharging its responsibility and also in ensuring that uh, uh, we do realize what we are planning to do as the department. Uh, so there's an indication as per the report which speaks to the assets that we have as a department. Uh, it is the fact uh, that uh, we have uh, assets, for instance, buildings uh, that we might be, you know, uh, having and we're not aware uh, of them. So now, when I was hearing you present and looking at the slides as presented, uh, the, the job by this unit is going to help us, you know, uh, identify that and be able to work on that. But over and above that, say, we are spending monies on what we, we have, because there's an indication also to say, we've got buildings that we are, that we are owning as a department and um, which are actually leased uh, to ourselves. If I have captured them very well and I've read with understanding uh, the, start, the, the, the slides. So that also, I think it helps to, to keep some of unnecessary uh, you know, spending that we are actually engaged on as the department. But at the same time, say, I think it also helps, you know, as a department to, to know and understand uh, the type of assets we have and as well as how many of those assets uh, we have, because as we speak, we have been struggling to reach 100% of the assets that we have as a department. Now, with this particular unit, uh, which will help us in, help in identifying uh, those uh, assets and see to it if then they are utilized for the purpose for which they were meant for. But at the same time, uh, Chair, I must also indicate that, you know, with all what they have actually presented, because we are the service delivery department, you know, uh, that will as well go a long way in terms of ensuring that the, the job opportunities that are there now, uh, in, you know, they are increased, and, and also the, the economy as well, uh, grow as per the contribution that we are making as, as this department. However, Jay, um, I'm a bit uh, worried um, uh, if then some of the officials or some of the jobs that is being done by this unit uh, is going to, you know, be a duplication of the job that should be done by uh, some of the officials who are in the department, and which that might actually lead to dereliction on duty by the officials. So if one can be clarified as to whether or not this is not gonna lead to duplication, which may cause some confusion and also 
that may cause one, uh, those who are supposed to be taking responsibility, not taking responsibilities and shifting the goalposts from this uh, to that or shifting the blames from this in, in an event that the job has not been done. So if one can be uh, clarified, if this is not be a duplication of the job that is, is supposed to be done or which is done by the department, which is now done by this unit. And thereafter, the spending that we are going to be uh, using on financing the, the unit and as well as, uh, you know, paying those who are in the department. Unless otherwise, maybe um, this unit is not uh, financed from us as the department. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you, Honorable Matabula. Honorable Mjabo. Honorable Mjabo. Uh, 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 and different from IDT. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairperson, and my apologies for joining me. Um, uh, the previous speakers, especially on the issue of the unused uh, houses. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. My apologies. Thank you, Honorable Jobo. Uh, though your line is not clear at all. Um, let me also add my voice in appreciating the two presentations uh, that have been done to us, the ESA presentation and the IGT presentation. Let me start with ESA presentation. Uh, one of the things that I may say is that we have captured precisely what is happening in the department with this report that you have presented to us. Uh, slide number seven. Uh, on the ESA presentation talks exactly to what is there in the Department of Public Works. This department has a potential of sustaining itself, of ensuring that uh, all the departments are housed in the departmental, in the government buildings. But because of its failure in maintaining the asset register, because this department doesn't know its own properties. That, that is the truth. That is something that we have said several times. Uh, but also, it is not utilizing even the properties that it knows. Uh, the, 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 the proposals that are made by ESA on this uh, term, what, what is it? I don't want to say rot. I want to be like uh, Honorable Brian Murray in saying R O T P. There is a there is P at, at the end because if we focus on 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 only the three words, it will be as if we are not uh, looking at that P. Uh, there is a on slide. I think it's slide number eleven. Um, there, there, there is a there is a there is a point there that I felt that if it can be done, uh, it it would yeah. Point number five on slide number eleven. Um, on 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 the strategy that they proposing. They're saying institutionalization of sustainability principles in the facility management program and alignment to other departmental initiatives, e.g. asbestos removal program. I'm, I'm raising that because right now, as, as members, we are staying in houses that has asbestos roof. When we know the health hazards uh, issues about asbestos roof. And something that we have raised several times with the department on how it can uh, 
do away with this uh, because one day someone will claim on the department on this thing that they they taking it very very lightly but i really appreciate this um, this strategy that is coming up with with uh, with ISA, but uh, the starting point will always be to ensure that uh, a fully maintained immovable asset register is there. Whether it's a lot of money uh, since we came in this parliament, in fact, even in the last administration. But even today, we're not yet talking about a, a fully a working a immovable asset register of, of the department. That, that is the, the, the first thing that I wanted to raise on, 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 on this. Um, uh, when ISA presented to us at the time that uh, they only had uh, uh, Dr. Only uh, we have seen now that uh, we have a water bank. We have all, we have many people. They indicated that they to employ to support one of the members who said. Uh, ought also to employ uh, uh, people that have the expertise uh, when they're dealing with property management. Because if we don't do that, we will be in what we are currently in, in the department. Uh, the reality is that uh, when you talk about PMTE, you don't see any, any movement. A case in point, even the department, it's this issue of the immovable asset register, which um, has not yet been finalized since 2019 when we came in. I think those that were part of this portfolio committee, even in the last administration, they will tell us since 2014. Tina was saying since 2019, it has not yet been a uh, it has not yet been uh, uh, finalized. Um, I think when when Minister was talking recently, she indicated that ESA has provided uh, over 200 uh, built environmental professionals to assist the municipalities in flood stricken provinces, that is KZN and Eastern Cape. Uh, if ESA can, within uh, months managed to mobilize such, why is the department failing to employ such? Uh, as we all know, Department of Public Works previously was a department that had so many artisans. It was also dealing with roads. They would not go out to find an engineer they would take engineers within the department to design and to do all those things. But these days they look for consultants and all that because they're not employing the necessary expertise that is needed in the department. I think, I think that needs to change uh, so that this department really does what it is expected to do. Linking with IDT, the issue of maintenance, it's one of the issues that the department is really failing. As I indicated earlier, you have properties, land that are there in your asset register, but the failure to maintain those properties is the one that reduces their value. Um, and you end up, with departments renting or leasing from private owners because the buildings that the department has, it is not maintaining. We have received, I don't know whether it's this year or last year, a report about Border Straw building in Amtata. If you can go there, it's a, it's a shadow of what it used to be ever since a project started there of maintaining that building, 
I think this is the 10th year that the Department of Public Works nationally is maintaining that building, putting in leaves, maintaining that. It's in the 10th year and that project has not yet uh, been done properly and finished because this department is failing when it comes to maintenance. We will then again add on what IDT is saying that the department should hand over its portfolio of maintenance to IDT. That way, IDT, as they have indicated, that if they can get that portfolio of maintaining, uh, I don't know whether it's they're saying two billion or whatever, they will be able to break even. I think we 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 support that view as the portfolio committee, and I think we should be proud of this portfolio committee because when the department minister wanted to cross IDT, we stood up as this portfolio committee and said that looking at what IDT has done before, you can't close such an entity. And now IDT has shown us uh, with the young, because they're also young ladies at the helm, the acting CEO, or the acting chairperson, they've managed to turn around this entity, IDT, to be where it is now, getting even maintenance jobs from other departments because they have a trust in it. They are seeing what it is doing. So we are adding on, on that voice of IDT, uh, minister, deputy minister, that when it comes to maintenance, please ensure that IDT is given uh, those because now IDT is not, in, in its report, it has never mentioned anything that is saying that it, this one is coming from the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure. We're getting uh, uh, shown that uh, Department of Correctional Services has a trust. Department of Higher Education, these departments, they are saying that IDT must do these projects. But when it comes to public works, there's nothing that is saying that public works has said that IDT must do these projects. I think. The Department of Public Works must show that it trusts its entity in, and it is sure that its entity, which is IDT, can do the work by giving it projects. So, at, And we said that what it can do is to give it this maintenance project. That way we are sure that it can do as it has shown us uh, that it does. So I also... Uh, Support uh, Honorable Siwisa when she was saying that uh, we are proud of these uh, uh, young women that are at the helm of, of IDT because they have turned around to that, that entity. We we seeing, uh, though, we're not yet there. We are not yet there, but we are seeing a, a serious improvement on what IDT used to be when we came in uh, in 2019. Um, with those a uh, few words, um, I then hand over to you. Uh, I know that um, Minister has left uh, the meeting now, but I think um, DM and 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 the two ISA and IGT then can respond on the questions and comments raised by honourable members. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Honourable Chairperson, and a good afternoon to your good self, uh, to the Honourable Members, um, to the Chair of IDT and Acting CEO, uh, as well as this team from ISA, as uh, led by Mamitsi. Um, together with the staff from Parliament that is supporting us. A, a good afternoon to, to everyone. Um, my, my approach, Chair, is usually that uh, I give the various uh, presenters and responsible units to take the areas of questions that affect them, and I will, I will be able to to come last. 
but I I do want to just uh, give a a or re-emphasize what uh, Minister had said in her opening uh, remarks um, when she was marking after the presentations that there is so much work for everyone. If these approaches are, are there to enhance uh, the work of maintenance because we all agree, none of us is running away from the fact that maintenance is our weakest area as government across the board. And therefore, um, when we want to deal with it, we cannot just uh, think that we will do one thing and, and the proper problems will be solved. We need to remind ourselves that uh, the focus of um, IDT is more on social infrastructure. Um, the program that ESA had uh, shared with us, uh, they have indicated uh, upfront that they work uh, with the department, especially the, the unit that deals with um, leasing, uh, which is housing the offices of the various departments. So here we are not, there's, there's no competition. There is more um, division of work. Um, I thought I needed to just uh, clear that one uh, before I hand over to the various uh, presenters. I think uh, because of the flow of uh, the presentations, I will start with you, Mamitsi, from uh, ISA, uh, of course, assisted by your team uh, to deal with the ISA issues and um, go to IDT to deal with the uh, IDT issues, the chair and uh, acting CEO. Um, they will respond and then I will come later to um, round up the, the, the first uh, round of questions. Uh, with your permission, Chair, uh, allow me to call on uh, Mametsi. Okay, dear. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Minister and uh, Honorable Chair and members again for the comments and question. Uh, I'll just respond back as, as directed by DM on items that focused on the ROTP strategy. And I think just as taking a leaf from uh, DM's comments around uh, the collaboration uh, aspect is that the program really hinges itself on collaboration both within the department and between uh, then the department and user client departments and national treasury and I think the, the, the council that's, that's really come from the members around ensuring that there is a, a clear scope of what division that DM has covered. And I think it's very important because our focus is on uh, mostly the commercial buildings, the underutilized and unutilized, precisely because uh, the strategy hinges on being able to attract uh, the private sector participants in collaborating with us in the refurbishment program. So that's that's where it stems from. And uh, there definitely has to be collaboration between ourselves and other entities of the department. And then uh, if I go specific into some of the comments that were made, which I appreciate as well, is I do take counsel around uh, ensuring that we, we learn from, from uh, other business models which have been successful in the market. And, you know, that's really part of our strategy. And we have been doing some uh, market sounding processes and uh, interacting with just some uh, players in the space around their thoughts and uh, getting some of that information into the strategy, which has been encouraging because we've received some positive feedback uh, from, from some of those engagements. 
and we think that it's definitely something that we need to take seriously. Then, talking about um, some of the details in the slides, uh, which were very, very specific around uh, the maintenance spend and the unutilized buildings, uh, those are definitely data points from our annual reports as the department and uh, further details can be found in the actual annual reports themselves. And if the honorable members require uh, further details, we can show via uh, DM be able to uh, provide that further detail uh, so that you can see what the breakdown is of those um, numbers and what they look like. But the annual report does give the breakdown of uh, what that spend is and where that spend was, was made. Uh, then, um, when it comes to the socioeconomic maximization model, and here, this is a strategy that uh, is actually being uh, developed and is also currently being um, piloted. And so, we would look into uh, sharing that uh, information so you could see what the intention of that strategy is. And it's really intended at looking at the state utilizing its economies of scale uh, position to ensure that uh, the state gets a, a, a fair uh, market practice uh, when it comes to services that we employ, but also in ensuring that uh, we empower uh, those that, that we work with and also improve on our social facilitation processes with uh, the communities as we implement projects. Then um, just going through the list here, I, I wrote some things on some make sure I don't miss out on anything. Um, okay, the issues about the number of facilities, that's that's also part of the annual report. Um, and then the unused facilities also part of the annual report. And issues around the slide, I think it was mentioned around slide 11. Yes, uh, that's based on some of the interactions we've had with our colleagues internally at works around the, the asbestos removal program. And it will be that as we look at other assets within our strategy that, that form that, we can be able to address that. But we do believe that the department also has other programs which will be dealing with the, with the, with the housing uh, aspect. And I'm sure that's, that's where that aspect, uh, we can get further details from the colleagues that are involved in that, in that program. Uh, yeah, from, from my side, I think definitely that's that's part of it. And then uh, there was a question around the expert firms or uh, the firms that we're working, working with. So uh, that information will be on a project by project basis to be able to acquire the, the, the skills that we need to uh, do financial modeling where we don't have it internally. But where we have it internally, definitely we will be utilizing the skills that we have. So even with developing the strategy, it's been, it's been part of the internal um, uh, resources that we've been using to come up with this. And so we'll continue the same way. And of course, as and when uh, additional skills are required, we'll have to follow due process within the department to make sure that uh, those get acquired uh, as per the supply chain management processes within the department. Yeah, and I hope I've addressed all of it. If I've missed anything, um, please advise Honorable Chair and I will um, gladly respond, but I think in conclusion, thank you very much for the comments and we do take counsel and we do think that a lot of the comments related to how we can improve the strategy will also add to us being able to refine it further and making sure that it benefits uh, the department and the state as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Tabang. Um, Acting Chair and uh, CEO. Thank you very much, uh, DM. Um, Honorable Chair of the Portfolio Committee and Honorable Members, we, we take note of your questions and your comments, and in particular, your compliments. We don't take them lightly. Um, as we say, and we would not have made the small strides that we've made if it wasn't for your support and also the support of our DM and, and the minister in the department. So we really are grateful for that. I call them small because there's still a long road ahead. 
Um, uh, and each day we take small steps because it is a large elephant and, we, and we're trying to take as small a bite as possible. So we, we thank you for your support and, and look forward to continue to work in great collaboration, both with yourselves and also the department. I'll hand over to the team to answer the detailed questions. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, thank you, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. Um, I will take the question on, um, there was a question on how are we putting in place measures to ensure that corruption does not take place, um, especially in the education sector um, uh, um, with regard to procurement. Um, what the IDT is looking at now is to procure an e-procurement system mm. where procurement will be done online. So our service providers will submit their bids online. The evaluation will be done online. The adjudication and the awarding will be done online. So this limits any interference that might be done by, by officials. And we hope that this system will also allow us to do that so that um, whatever is submitted, there's no tempering. Um, the outcome will be what the outcome should have been. And then we have also beefed up our internal audit unit. So we have about four to five people, but we are still going to appoint more because of the portfolio and the size that we have. So that um, our bids are then, um, there's a, there's a um, compliance that's done before we even our to ensure that everything is above board before we issue out appointment letters. And also to ensure that um, the process is fair <clears throat> and all the procurement processes are followed. So we have already appointed people, but we will still um, beef up that capacity so that um, there's, um, what do you call this? Um, measures taken um, to account and ensure that um, processes are, are followed. Um, I will hand over to my colleague for the rest of the questions. Um, Chair, thank you. It's to Michel again. And, um, just on a lighter note, Chair, I'm actually also young. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a pleasure working with these uh, two phenomenal women uh, under the leadership chair. I know, no, no, no. We have seen that you are young. Uh, we have seen that IGT is, is in for young people. We appreciate that. But also, yeah. experience is good. No, <laughs> Siabong, um, Slalo, um, I will take the question, the technical questions in the main. Um, we, the question from Honorable um, Suisa uh, around the timelines for execution. So in our interaction with the minister's office, she has made it um, clear uh, that uh, it is non-negotiable that we should start the ball rolling um, on the 1st of September. So having said that, we will then obviously um, put together a, a plan, an execution plan, which execution plan will be shared uh, accordingly. And this will be the execution plan wherein we, we, we measure ourselves against. Um, of course, IDT being a program and a project management entity or implementing agent rather, we, we are bound by those um, um, timelines, um, Chair and Honorable Members. Um, uh, what uh, the first honourable member asked a question in terms of and 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 forgive me that I did not note uh, his name was how do we integrate between um, the strategy of the ROTP and the strategy of the IDT and I think there it is very important that we make reference to to the uh, implementation framework that I I presented um, during my presentation because that talks to to that integration but also most important of all um, chair is that. Um, when we do these ROTPs, and I think um, Honorable um, Graham Murray referred to it as well, we need to have a, an integrated approach wherein um, the planning teams or the consulting teams and the contractors are not disengaged from engaging facilities management teams and maintenance teams in order to have that seamless um, um, approach in how we do, how we construct buildings vis-a-vis -vis how we then, we then maintain them. Um, moving right along, uh, uh, the questions from Graham, uh, Honorable Graham Marais and the, actually the comments are, are very much appreciated and, and, and make a lot of sense in terms of how we should be doing things um, going forward, especially around the heritage buildings. I think we often miss the bigger picture there and we, uh, we find ourselves um, damaging uh, history 
and uh, history that has uh, over the years been uh, maintained and over the years been uh, protected. So we, we, I come from an environment where, where, where most of the buildings that we dealt with were, were heritage buildings, and it's one of the um, professional services that we will have to uh, bring on board um, in terms of the heritage specialists. And uh, around the lease agreements, including an FM element, I think that uh, it, it, it's a no, it's a no-brainer that we we should move in that direction. Um, and 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 I guess this is really to public works, but it goes a long way when we know that um, as the IDT, in terms of the total facilities management strategy, will also be checking in terms of do those lease agreements that we 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 have to look over in terms of a maintenance approach, do they include the maintenance? Uh, element or the facilities management element, and if they do, um, what is the service level agreements? So, um, again, it, it has to be an overarching mm -hmm. MM strategy. I think um, Honorable Hicklin referred to how can we borrow um, in terms of how can we borrow or adopt how the likes of Brawl, um, Bidvest and all these big um, facilities management companies, how do they do it and how do they get it right? And I think in the main is that they've got service level agreements, which service level agreements are, are, are properly managed. So um, just like with the system, it's one thing to have a good system, it's one thing to have a service level agreement in place, but it's another to make sure that you've got the right people um, to manage um, both the system and the, and, and, and the service level agreements that are in place. So, so we take um, honorable uh, Hicklin's um, comments uh, into, into, into consideration that um, in recruiting and selecting the right people to do this job, it's people that will be able to then um, for, uh, adopt these models and or be able to implement um, these models. Um, uh, uh, honorable Van uh, uh mentioned um, the smooth transition of the system and the recruitment of professionals, I think that is what uh, the IDT is currently doing. And I think in terms of the system, um, yes, there's, there's multiple systems that are out there. And I think that uh, transition into amalgamating the system into one big system, it, it is a, it's a discussion that I'm thinking in the short to long term, we should have with the likes of CETA <laughs> to guide us in terms of how can we put together a system that will talk to all the implementing agents, including the department and all departments that are involved in infrastructure, i.e. Uh, DBE, Department of Higher Education and Training, uh, Department of Health, et cetera, so that we have one amalgamated system that talks to the infrastructure delivery of, um, of the country. And I think, um, Chair, lastly, it was, it was your comment, and, and, and I think it talks to the heart of, of, of maintenance and maintenance making sure that um, we, are, we are not found wanting. Maintenance starts right at the beginning, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, it starts just with cleaning and making sure that, um, you know, in the total facilities management strategy, things like cleaning, things like um, uh, dusting off your aircons from the dust and so on, are just done daily like they should be, uh, 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 so that you don't find ourselves right at the end, reacting and being reactive when there's a, a huge litigation. So I, I, I really welcome all those questions and comments, uh, uh, Chair, in the spirit that they are aimed at building a better um, infrastructure for, uh, for this country and, 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 and the generations to come. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Any, any additions from uh, Acting CEO? Um, oh, uh, thank you very much, um, Honorable. And, and then the I'm, I'm, I'm covered. after you. Yeah, no, I'm covered, Chair. Um, I, I wouldn't want to add anything on what um, the chairperson of the board and my executive have said. They have covered me. Thank you. Over to you, dear. And I thank you. Thank you uh, once more, Chair. Um, many of the comments and the questions from honorable members uh, are, are, are more based on the performance of PMTE uh, on, on properties, which is what has brought us to 
uh, drives this strategy that ISA uh, works with PMTE because of the very understanding that um, things are the way they are with PMTE having this responsibility, but not able to live up to the expectation. And we, we worked with ISA with the understanding that ISA has got amongst themselves, besides the people that we have employed as a department, um, they have expertise and um, professionals from the private sector that have been seconded to them. So we are tapping from those expertise to enhance and work on the weaknesses of PMTE, which are departmental weaknesses. And um, Honorable Hickling spoke of, we need to have ducks in a row, um, which are flying to the same direction. And I cannot agree more with her. And this is what we are trying to do. Uh, it is to try and say, here, uh, PMTE needs assistance and support from ISA. And therefore, ISA, please drive a strategy for us uh, together, working together with um, PMTE. But also, on the other hand, ITT is also building social infrastructure uh, for this for the public sector and for the state, and such also uh, is is we build schools worth hundreds of millions, but in no time you see them dilapidated because the the company that would have been uh, responsible for that project, their lifespan is, starts from building this, the, the school and it ends once the building is handed over. Now, the day-to-day -day maintenance, the Department of Education uh, does not in itself have those expertise. And we then said, because maintenance should be part of the budgeting upfront, at the point that you are planning to build the school. Um, and uh, IDT, you are working on um, social infrastructure. Let us include maintenance of this uh, infrastructure in, 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 in a manner that uh, seeks to share uh, these responsibilities or allocate these responsibilities in a manner that will help us quickly address this weakness that we all admit that government does have. And, and therefore the strategy is going to work across government, uh, but uh, the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure as the driver of the infrastructure policy has to have uh, this, the lead in, in the strategy and hence the timelines as well. And I hope, uh, Honorable Franz Karpvig, your question on the seamless IT system, I think uh, it has been covered because that's exactly what we would want to do. We would want a seamless, to see a seamless process right from building uh, until the end. But we can't start there now because there are already buildings that are existing. And therefore, we need a strategy to deal with the backlog as well. And, and, and hence, uh, this presentation. On, on the, uh, um, just, just a little correction, uh, Honorable Chair. It is not ISA that mobilize the professionals for the uh, flood stricken areas. It is CBE, the Council for the Built Environment. They are the ones who mobilized 
uh, the professionals that are registered with them to go and assist the affected uh, localities and uh, communities. Um, and therefore, ISA would not be in a position to, to really uh, answer that because it wasn't uh, necessarily uh, them who, who recruited uh, or who mobilized these professionals. On the question of the asset register, uh, we need to, to again here indicate to the honorable members that uh, in the last financial year, that is 21-22, um, no, not 21-22, um, in the 2021 financial year, the the asset register was audited and uh, it it was uh, an, it received an unqualified uh, audit which means um, it passed the test what we need to do is to ensure that we keep the um, updating it such that it, it maintains that status. So I, I do want to say that uh, even these buildings, we know where they are, they both unutilized and those that are um, what hijacked and or those that are illegally occupied. And this seeks to the strategy also seeks to identify, we must be able to say this property, if we uh, refurbish it, we refurbish it for what? Should we keep it or should we dispose of it? Now, honorable members, all, uh, uh, most of the honorable members are indicating communities that uh, need to utilize or to purchase these properties. And for me, there's, there's nothing stopping those who want to do so, uh, contacting our offices in the regions where they are, um, so that that can be channeled through the uh, channels to, of, of uh, disposal. Um, and they follow the, the, the procedures uh, that we the department has uh, in terms of the disposal policy, whether they are sold, whether they are handed over, we 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 just uh, when we're talking when we're discussing the leasing um, policy and reviewing it, we were discussing exactly about those facilities that can be utilized by communities. Um, one example, the, 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 the houses that the safe houses for GPV um, victims, a property that would be state owned, but utilized by the community, um, supported, of course, by uh, the Department of Social Development and SAPS and all that. But um, and that, that property would not necessarily be owned, but it can be utilized by an NGO that works uh, with the victims of GPV to a point where then that um, uh, NGO stops, the, the property reverts back to the state. But where NGOs have the muscle to buy, uh, for their own purposes, they can also do so. But those are, um, there are procedures that one would have to follow uh, to get to the point uh, of, of um, ensuring that those properties are utilized. And we have been crisscrossing the country, uh, identifying those that could be utilized for GPV, there are those that could be utilized for communities, but sometimes, honorable members, 
the, um, people simply say this is a public works property. And when you go to check the assets, especially those assets that were in the homelands, most of those properties would be owned or would be in the asset registers of provincial departments of public works. And we are trying to synchronize our approaches to, to disposal so that a, a province doesn't do um, differently from one other province. Um, and hence this review of policy so that it informs the rest of the country. Um, on heritage uh, buildings, uh, it, it is good that um, Honorable um, Graham, Graham Mare is, is raising this, but I also would want to remind the Honorable Members that we do work with the Heritage Council um, just on the parliamentary issue. Uh, we worked hand in hand with them uh, it, and they did indicate in their report to parliament that it's not only um, parliament with all other buildings, uh, but they are stronger in the Western Cape precisely because most of the older uh, facilities are there. What we could then do is to check with our regional offices elsewhere in the country uh, in terms of their relations with the Heritage Council that we can uh, coordinate to ensure that there are no regions that are slipping up uh, on that uh, important task. With regard to who is responsible for what in the SLAs with such departments as SAPS and others, those SLAs are very clear um, where, the, where, the, where there is an agreement. In, in some, a region will agree with SAPS that SAPS will, will do own maintenance. And, and therefore, in such instances, um, to the tune of X, uh, there would be a, a threshold um, set up for that. Where, the, where then SAPS does not do it, uh, or any other department for that matter, that has been delegated. Um, I think as part of our coordinating and um, oversight role, and as also as part of our constituency work as members, where we meet such that um, this uh, police station, I've received quite a number of letters from members who would be saying this police station in area X in Butterworth uh, is not worth, and we would do the necessary follow-ups and we would clarify who is responsible for what. So I do want to encourage uh, the honorable members that um, it is not because of weaknesses in the policy. Uh, most of the time it is weaknesses in the execution and hence our oversight role becomes important. But obviously the, the, the two of us in the ministry uh, cannot be everywhere all the time and hence our um, pleas to members to say um, where you find an anomaly, uh, where you find a, a challenge, please raise it with, with us so that we also um, are able to follow it up. I think, Chair, um, with your permission, I should stop there and um, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, DM, and, and your team. Um, not sure whether, uh, are there any follow-up questions from the honorable members? 
Uh, no follow-up questions. Um, uh, Diam and 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 both teams and your team from the department, uh, we really appreciate um, this presentation and the responses in the questions and comments that we have made as the members of the portfolio committee. We doing our work that of oversighting this department and its entities. So when we ask problem questions, it's because we want the people of South Africa to know what is happening. Uh, the reality is that we have taken a decision as the portfolio committee that in our respective um, constituencies, we will look not going on a formal oversight where we all go but go there and look at these properties. That's why it is easy for us to mention all the properties that are there, to mention all the projects that the department has not finished and has left them as, as I've done by mentioning the, the, the Bodasta building in Mtata. And, uh, and I know you also know about that as someone who's coming from Eastern Cape. Um, but we we have hope uh, that with the entities that you have uh, in the department, something can be changed. But uh, another thing that uh, we can fully say is that uh, the the department, when we came in, it had a it had a project of a school, but uh, we we were then informed that there's no budget for that, and it's a project then it had to be left out because we asked uh, questions. What about this school that you are mentioning? And then we had we know that there is no school at all. But the reality is that um, in this time where there is a high unemployment rate, um, young people are just walking around the streets because they have nowhere where they can work. I think the, the issue of taking in artisans in the department, uh, Deputy Minister, would really improve a lot uh, with some of these uh, maintenance projects. So I think it's a project that you need to revive uh, as, as, as the department. Not necessarily taking people to universities, to, but the Tibet colleges are there. They offering plumbing. They offering ele uh, electricians uh, courses a lot, broilers a lot. I think you need to look at that. Uh, I think that way, this department is one of the departments. Uh, if it can work properly, it can create jobs. So I think you need to look at that, um, Minister. We appreciate your time and 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 uh, your entities that were here with us. Um, Mandy, do we have any announcements to Ape or whatever? Do we have any announcements? Or oh, again, uh, um, DM, I appreciate the correction uh, on 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 that one that it was CPE, not ESA that brought in those uh, three hundred. Uh, from the built environment. Thank you. Any announcements, Mandy? Um, no, Jay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, nothing, nothing from the side, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me again appreciate uh, your robust uh, deliberations and discussions in the meeting, honorable members, as you always do. We will then uh, meet on the 30th, in which we'll be dealing with the bill list of our expropriation bill. Um, thank you again, DM and your team. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. And everyone. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Recordings.